Bulletproof Radio, a state of high performance. Hey, it's Dave Asprey with Bulletproof Radio. Today's cool fact of the day is that even though Asperger's syndrome is an autism spectrum disorder, studies show that the Asperger's brain has different, stronger connectivity patterns than the autistic brain, especially in areas of the left hemisphere. Also, intelligence and academic performance separates Aspies or Asperger's syndrome people, and it's generally thought that Einstein had Asperger's. And this is going to be a really interesting episode because uh, we're going to talk about Asperger's, and a lot of people don't know this, but I come from a family where it's very common, and I had all those symptoms of it but was not formally diagnosed uh, when I was formally diagnosed, I had already done huge amounts of biohacking and was only diagnosed with uh, ADD, uh, which is, uh, I'm grateful that I was able to make that shift. But we're going we're gonna to talk a lot about this and how, it's, how it affects your brain, how it, it's coming to be more popular, and how you can actually use it as a tool. So I'm, I'm pretty excited about this interview. Before we go into it, though, uh, I would love to chat with you briefly about Bulletproof XCT oil. This is uh, our most affordable oil that you can use in Bulletproof Coffee. It's not just MCT oil. MCT oil is four kinds of oils, one of which gives you disaster pants and is very commonly found in trace amounts in, in a lot of the preparations out there. And the other one is actually reasonably good for you. It unfortunately is mislabeled as an MCT oil. It's legal to call it an MCT oil, but it doesn't go to energy in the body. It actually goes through the liver like a long chain fat. So XCT oil is just two of the four MCT oils that companies will try to sell you. And it's triple distilled, never any solvents used, and it's made in the United States, not in China. And it is made on food grade machines. So if you like to know what you're getting and you like to get the most affordable way to get your ketones up a little bit, not as much as brain octane, but enough to really feel the difference in your day, go for Bulletproof XCT oil. I use it quite a lot on my salad, and it's amazing. Bulletproof.com. Today's guest is Joe Beal. He's a really interesting guy, and you might not have heard of him, but you probably will. He's an independent filmmaker and a self-made publisher who's gotten to be known for using punk rock tactics in publishing. He founded a company called Microcosm Publishing at 18 years old, literally running it from his closet, and started the Portland Zine Symposium. The reason he's on the show is he just released a book called Good Trouble, Building a Successful Life and Business with Asperger's, because he has Asperger's syndrome and is doing a lot of really cool and interesting stuff. He's definitely a biohacker, and Joe, welcome to the show. (laughs) <laughs> Thanks for having me. Your book was, was pretty fascinating because you, you talk about sort of your, your journey when you were a teenager. By the way, how old are you now? I am 38. 38. So, so we're, we're going back. What You and I are about the same age. I'm 43, so you're five years younger than I am. But uh, you, you spent a long time as an entrepreneur, and a surprising number of entrepreneurs are ADD, ADHD, uh, Asperger's, uh, ODD, or somewhere on the spectrum of not neurotypical, and you've taken all this experience and put it into a book, which is which is really really pretty cool. Walk Thanks, me yeah. through your story, like 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 how did you get into all this stuff? Uh, what what happened before you were diagnosed? What happened when you were a teenager? Sure, sure. So I um, my childhood was pretty. I mean, there's no way about it. Bad. You know, I grew up in Cleveland. Um, you know, in the posts steel, uh, you know, through the recession of the eighties and, you know, and it's, um, my dad was physically disabled. Um, my mom was very violent, you know, so I like left the house as much as I could. And so I didn't really have parenting as a kid. Um, but so I found punk rock at a very young age, um, 13 or 14. And that kind of helped me to figure out, um, you know, morals and ethics and, you know, things that really still guide me today. Um, but you know, your age or my age, we're too old to have been diagnosed, um, as children with Asperger's. They didn't know it existed. Yeah. Um, and so that's the, the difficulty of it is that, you know, so I wasn't, um, I'm just kind of bumbling through life. You know, I feel different. I don't really relate with other people. Like my experience is very solitary, but you know, I've, and I, and you know, and then the, you know, the, 
other problems like I feel unchallenged in my, you know, academics. <laughs> Everything is boring, know? right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. And so it's like, um, you know, I mastered um, calculus in ninth grade and then I felt like I had nothing to do. So I stopped trying, you know. Okay. And, and so that um, kind of thing, you know, sort of plagued me. And so I was a bad kid, you know. I, like, got in trouble a lot. You know, I did a lot. You know, and I just didn't have that kind of um, an understanding of, like, right and wrong in that way. Did you get in a lot of fights? Yeah, yeah, when I was younger, sure. If you were going to school today, would you be in jail? Um, I feel, well, it depends where, you know. <laughs> I mean, because okay. that's the thing is, like, where I grew up, that was pretty normal, you know, yeah. and so there, you know, I was the least of the problems, you know, <laughs> but, and and so that's, I think for a lot of it is, you know, I have a lot of funny stories in the book because I was up to, you know, mischievous pranks all the time, <laughs> Yeah, you know, and so that, you know, and that's like how you entertain yourself right. when you're in a position like I was. And so, um, I, you know, through punk rock, I discovered publishing and I found, you know, originally in the 90s, I discovered zines, which are, you know, like some a combination of a love letter and a book. And they would, you know, teach me about subjects that I did not yet know that I was interested in. Would you be comfortable saying that zines were like uh, Facebook pages? <laughs> <laughs> for people long before we had any of this cool internet <laughs> stuff. It, it's kind of yeah. like having your, a blog or something, like it, like a pre-blog kind of thing. I, I used to be into zines as well, but uh, right. they, but they've I kind of come and gone. I think, well, no, actually, no, there's more zines being published now than ever. Oh, really? I, I don't mm -hmm. follow it, but okay, there are, okay. And so, and I feel like the difference is that, like, it's similar to a Facebook page in that it's an obsession, you know? Okay. It's like an obsession that you cannot contain and you have to tell everybody about. But the the difference is it's like a safe space. Like you aren't going to be regaled by internet trolls for your, you know, your views on your subject of choice, you know. And and so in that way, it's comfortable and it's like a way to figure out your voice and what how you feel about things and what you believe in deeply as an individual, you know. And so I think that's one of the reasons that they're still so successful, you know, uh, where, you know, in the, like, Zine started in the 1930s, so we're like 85 years in, you know. But like, it, it's relevant for the same reason, even you know, through the internet. Okay, that that makes sense. And you made uh, another comment there that you learned about like morals and ethics. It says like some of your your rules of social behavior through through punk rock. Because yeah. when you have Asperger's, you, you don't know the social norms. Like like you didn't see them. They, they they didn't get uploaded or something. How did punk rock help you with that? So. And I, and I think, you know, there's a little bit similarly with all these things, especially with Asperger's. Um, but punk rock has just as many misconceptions as Asperger's does, you know. And so um, many times people don't, they think of it as nihilistic or um, whatnot. But to me, punk rock really taught me like social justice values and about like the importance of learning about history and about learning about how and why to respect other people, which I feel like is not, you know, it's like when you don't have mere neurons and you don't understand what people are communicating emotionally, as I did not, you have a really hard time understanding then all the things that that feeds into, you know? And so punk rock really taught me all those things, sometimes clumsily, sometimes awkwardly, sometimes many years after, you know, I, I joke that, a, you know, a, a newborn baby had more emotional intelligence than I did until I was, you know, 35 or so. What changed? How did you grow emotional intelligence? Um, so I was, um, so Asperger's is defined through failure, you know, that you, like Asperger's is not a disability until it causes oh. failure in your life. And so I had, you know, created, I founded Microcosm when I was 18 years old, you know, I had done all these things, I had gone on and, you know, sort of clumsily walked into walls my way through life, you know, <laughs> periodically. You, you don't and see to, some things that other people find blindingly obvious, and I, I very much sympathize with that, okay. And I think, you know, and a lot of it is the, especially for people that are our age, you know, in that range, you resolve, you, you get rid of bullying through becoming an expert on a subject, you know. And so I really became obsessed fundamentally with, you know, th this idea of like, 
not only, you know, the, the punk rock music, but also like the social history and, you know, things like DIY skills. And I, I really became the expert on those things. And, you know, that sort of afforded me being a weirdo, you know, that people would, and, and many, many people have utilized similar tactics, you know, who grew up, uh, who are too old to be diagnosed as children. But inevitably, by the time I was in my 20s, you know, I started to run into problems. I would offend people unknowingly, yeah. and then I would offend people, and they would see it as I was being callous or things like that. And I had gotten married very young, um, and that my, um, you know, my marriage fell apart uh, within two years or so. And that was really the big wake up call for me was that, you know, I didn't really have an idea of like what a healthy relationship looked like. And but then after the fact, you know, I'm I went into therapy, and I began learning about, um, you know, what are emotional norms and how should I feel in a relationship <laughs> I, and I, what it should it be offering me you know I, I'm laughing because because a lot of people listening are like what the hell right right to me, yeah. I'm like yeah, yeah yeah I totally like like no, I, I'm just laughing because I totally sympathize with this uh, I, I've also been divorced I, I you know I was in a marriage that didn't work and, and it's because stuff that you're supposed to know you just don't know right mm -hmm. and then it's okay. also I think to some degree the thing they don't really tell you or talk about is that the kind of people that create a, a, a lot of emotional proximity to Aspies are people that don't tend to have very good boundaries. So <laughs> what you're a codependent magnet? Is that what you just said? Um, not necessarily, <laughs> okay. but it's more like um, people that expect you to change and figure these things oh, okay. out on your own but don't really have a way to put up a barrier around that, you know? So mm -hmm. it's like people that have sort of their own kind of emotional intelligence problems um, or, do you know, or just never were taught about that as children or whatever. And so for me, at least, what happened is I became close to a lot of people that didn't know how to tell me what they did and didn't want. And so that creates like further problems of just basic level communication. A lot of people have that that program running, uh, and I, I've interviewed actually a bunch of guests recently talking about like how you get programs before you're seven that are kind of subconscious. Uh, Vishen Lakhani's uh, new book, uh, The Code of the Extraordinary Mind, writes a lot about this. And if you somehow learned when you were a little kid that asking for what you want is a bad thing, which if you ask for what you want and your parents yell at you enough times, you pretty much learn not to do that. And then you'll carry that right up into your first marriage and you'll never ask for what you want and then you'll be pissed off you didn't get what you want. And lo and behold, like it's not going to be what you wanted it to be because you never asked. So I, I totally get that. And so I was coming from the other direction where I knew what I wanted. I would always ask for what I and wanted. Bluntly. <laughs> and, you're right, right. Exactly. And like without any sort of care or yeah. understanding of how it was coming across, I would, you know, I would just be like, well, you know, you want to go to this place. I want to go to this place, you know, and it wasn't. And so I was like, so what are we going to do? You know, it wasn't like a <laughs> hearing the other person yeah. kind of situation. And so that, you know, that doesn't really go well. But through talking it out, years later i sort i could untangle all the ways that it was an unhealthy relationship for everybody you know and that really really you know so i and then i feel like and and some aspies debate me about this but i feel like in you know i mean i guess the thing that we know is that um aspies never stop intellectually growing you I, know? I, I was about to say what will an aspie not debate you about Exactly. Yes. Yeah. I, I and I, I I was very very overjoyed to find um, the Aspie forums until I found that any subject was a controversy, <laughs> even things that you know everybody had shared experiences around. And then I was like, well, I guess maybe this is not my place after all. The the over intellectualization uh, of things is is no better or worse than under intellectualization of things, right? Yeah. Uh, but but when it's over when it's overdone like that, you end up in lots of just very long debates, and some internet trolling probably comes from that. And I think most internet trolling just comes from uh, the bullies who probably picked on both of us when you know when we were in school. They tried to pick on me, but given that I was a beast, I usually just sat on them, and it solved that problem. But you know, 
Yeah. And uh, yeah, I was very, you know, I had like a big mohawk and I, okay. you know, I was like, I would wear like sleeveless shirts and, you, you know, I, you didn't, you didn't look like someone to tango with. So you were probably okay. Right. And I, you know, I, yeah. And that was part of it too. And, you know, and I was larger than most, I'm six foot three. You know, okay. I'm so six was, four. So, so we we're both, neither of us was a good target, but man, I, right. every year I had to kick someone's ass at least once or twice before people were like, you really don't want to fight with Dave because he'll leave marks on you. And I'm like, oh, that's good. Right. Right. And that, you know, and that I didn't really ever think of it in that way. But yeah, by the time I was in high school, I had built up such a defense mechanism for it, you know, that it, yeah, it was no longer a problem. I think kids today uh, who would have done the things that you and I would have done to be amused uh, as as people with Asperger's undiagnosed in, in high school bored out of our, our minds, I'm always amazed that I never really got arrested for something stupid <laughs> because right. like, like that was the norm. And, and like I said, it depends on where you go to school. But what <laughs> for me was someone attacked me after school and I kicked their ass. Um, right. Now is like, you know, cause for a year in jail and you're like, I don't know how kids do it today because I wouldn't have been able to do it. Right. Yeah. I mean, and I definitely had scuffles with the cops and whatnot when I was a kid. But it it was, again, it was just like the climate was such they had bigger problems. There you you go. So you you look like someone they should arrest, but when they talk to you, like, yeah, whatever. Yeah. Yeah. And I think it was, you know, I didn't have any crazy history or, you know, I mean, I hadn't done anything. I was causing trouble, but I wasn't, you know. There were no capital crimes, you know. Yeah, exactly. Like, like I just feel like today people are much harsher on on kids and teenage boys without Aspergers cause a lot of trouble, and ones with Aspergers typically, right. <laughs> they they just do it with less elegance. Maybe I, I don't know. I I'm I'm happy that I was a kid then, not a kid now. We'll put it that way. Mm-hmm. Why did you write your book? Because I mean, you, you talk about building a successful life and a successful business with Aspergers. I mean, did you write that for people who are teenagers now? Did you write that for you know, like, like who? Who's it for? So yeah, I feel like it's it's a few different things. You know, I feel like you don't have to have Aspergers obviously to relate with yeah. or appreciate the book because I think everybody is a weirdo in some senses. You know, especially the mm-hmm. kind of person that's obsessive enough to be an entrepreneur or to you know to want to be in that position. You know. So I feel like that there's that hand and then, you know, and it's like I have, um, you know, I've done what I do for over 20 years. So I have people that, you know, this is kind of the writing that they had always wanted from me, you mm-hmm. know, as a fan. And I had never really been ready before. Um, and so I waited for our 20th anniversary, um, f- you know, uh, mostly to get my house in order to understand exactly what was going on. But, you know, I, I feel like the real problem as I came to read all the existing literature, and I do mean all of it, was that uh, (laughs) when I would look at the way, especially um, non-sufferers would talk about it, it was always about mitigating failure. And I feel like that is, it's just such a horrible barometer, you know, because I do feel like all of the famous cases are these tremendously successful people But instead, we're trying to find ways of like how to keep, you know, uh, Aspies off of social services and how to, you know, find some level of what we call high functioning. But I feel like that's a it's just a misnomer, you know, and I feel like by aiming low, you inevitably achieve, you know, low results. And, And so I really wanted to show that, like, like my life was not charmed in any sense of the meaning. You know, I had to really, really fight for everything I got and I never got all that much, you know. And so to me, it was never, and then the more I looked at it, the more I was like, I'm not doing this, you know, so I can achieve personal wealth. Like I'm doing this to create resources for the people that are doing this in my wake that are growing up in these kind of environments. And, you know, I feel like if I had had anything to look at, you know, I would have helped me, you know, and I just didn't, you know, and so a lot of it is like, and, you know, and that's all that microcosm does really is looking at these you know, various kinds of DIY skills and like the, you know, how, what came before and what that can inform us about now, you know? It's really interesting. I I hang out with, with Dan Sullivan, who has for about 40 years been working with entrepreneurs to teach them how to, uh, how to put a business together and how to maybe build an operating system for a business. Mm -hmm. And his point, and he's one of the wiser guys I've met as an entrepreneur. His point is, is like, look, look around the room. And the, you have to like audition or like fill out a bunch of papers to even qualify to be in the coaching program with Dan himself. 
And he's like, how many of you have been diagnosed with ADD in like, like three quarters of the room? Right. And he goes, yeah. he goes, and everyone else in here, you have it, you just don't know you have it, right? <laughs> right, <laughs> right. Yes. Your and diagnosis then, hasn't happened yet. <laughs> right, but, but he's like, like, so like, let's just talk about some behaviors and everyone was like, oh my God, there's like all these people. Why were we all drawn to be high performance entrepreneurs? It's, it, there's like some neurological thing there. Uh, and um, when you accept that, that that might be part of your entrepreneurial reality, uh, then all of a sudden, what may have been a, a, a weakness or that you know overcoming failure thing, suddenly it's like it actually is also a strength when you realize that you have instincts that are are in certain things and and knowing those, it's having Asperger's at least high functioning where you know assuming you don't have full blown autism where you know you you are unable to deal with environmental inputs altogether. Uh, but it, assuming that, that you have the, the cognitive and, and like basic neurological function that you need to do that, as an entrepreneur, it, it can be a gift because, like you said, you're obsessive uh, looking into something where, you, like I said, you've read all the papers on it. Same thing with biohacking, right? Like, like why, I, I yeah. care a lot about the anti-aging stuff and, and fertility and hormones, and so I read everything and I build a picture in my head about it because that's what my biology, so my brain wiring helps me do. And the fact that I have social skills now that, that came at, at the cost of a lot of hard work. And, and I probably still miss a few little social cues, but I don't really care because at this point, if I really, people are going to tell me if I do that. And if they don't, yeah. I miss it. I didn't know that I missed it. So who cares? Mm-hmm. <laughs> like right. not to sound too egotistical, but like, Hey, I'm doing my best here. And it, it doesn't really matter. Not as much as I used to be because I, I lived for a long time kind of in fear. Like, like I, I know I'm not going to get this. Like, I, it, it's going to be awkward. And it's like, now you just kind of roll with it. That may be just the voice of, of wisdom of years, uh, but also understanding more about my wiring because of the, the things we've probably both read about, about Asperger's and how the brain works and things like that. Mm-hmm. What did you learn in terms of like ups and downs of running a business as someone who has Asperger's? Like, what, what did it bring you and what did it make more difficult? Yeah, I, I mean, I feel like literally every success I ever had was because I had Asperger's. Wow. You know, I, I don't, I mean, and I, and I, you know, and I charted it, you know, when I was <laughs> researching the book, I was like, this is the only reason that, you know, and I meet, you know, obviously uh, there's, no shortage of book publishers on earth. And every time I meet them, they just have such poor understanding. I mean, you know, this is the, I'm generalizing, but the, the, the generalization is that they have very poor math skills. They have very poor business skills. Data never enters the equation of decision-making, you know, whereas to me, it's like, I can do it all in my head and I know the, the probability of a manuscript success you know, within seconds, because I can think about it and realize, oh, well, this is, you know, about how many, how big the audience is, this is, you know, how well we could reach that audience, this is, uh, you know, how it's different from the existing material on the subject, you know. So, so that that's a skill that's easy for you, but maybe knowing whether you should trust the person sitting across from you, how easy is that? Well, so this, it, so... My um, my upbringing actually informed that. Um, okay, cool. I can really smell um, dishonesty a mile away because that's, I was... That's served. unusual for an Aspie. Right. And I think it was just... Be- but again, we learn by failing. Okay. <laughs> and I, you know, I was raised in such a dishonest environment that mm. after the hundredth time, I was yeah. never going to fall for it again, you know? The, the learning by failing thing is is really perceptive and every night when I put my kids to bed and I, I don't, th- I think both my kids are neurotypical. Like I designed a whole uh, fertility a preconception program <laughs> so that they wouldn't have uh, uh, ADD or Asperger's or whatever else. And they, they appear normal at six and eight. So fingers crossed that it, it worked right. uh, given the genetic risk and all that other stuff. But I, I still every night, I tell them, tell me one thing you failed at today. And then I'm like mm-hmm. high-fiving them for it. Like, good job, you failed at something. That means you were working really hard on it. So <laughs> right, but, right. like, they're not afraid to fail. And if they don't fail, I'm like, oh, maybe tomorrow you can, you can work so hard that you'll fail at something. Because today, you know, it wasn't a good day because there wasn't at least one thing you failed at. So like, like I'm trying to, to get them to not be fear avoidant, whereas like I'm going to go kick some ass. Because I, I think that makes happier kids who probably do kick more ass, but I'll tell you in 18 years, right? <laughs> mm-hmm. And so, for, I mean, I guess for me, that is more like, um, it's very intellectually lonely, Yeah, you know, at this point, you know, at 38, where I'm, 
I've sort of mastered my craft in a, you know, in a very difficult industry, I just don't have a lot of peers that are intellectual equals and, you know, have similar knowledge bases. And so why not that? um, And I, you know, I feel like in some ways people have other, you know, they come at it from other reasons. There's other interests, you know, or they just don't master these kind of, um, you know, the, the business side of it as well as the publishing side of it. You know, it, it is tough to to find a, a tribe of people who are, are kicking some ass. I've spent a lot of time in the last five years, like realizing that for me to perform really well, I have to have a community of people like that. So I, I, I Dan Sullivan, uh, uh, Joe Polish uh, from the Genius Network, and JJ Virgin, uh, New York Times bestselling author, you know, really mm-hmm. got me plugged into all, like networks like that. But I spend a honestly a disturbing amount of money. And weeks of every year uh, going to places to hang out with people like that because I just, I don't know how to continuously bring it the way I do if I don't get people like that in my life. So uh, right. that was a conscious multi-year effort for me in order to, to do that as you know, one of my, one of the ways I perform really well. It's like I've got to spend some time with, with people like that. Otherwise, like, like I said, it, it's a little too lonely intellectually mm-hmm. and, and in other ways too. Sure. And, and, you know, in, in my industry, it's very much stuck in the, you know, 19th century in many ways still. And, and, you know, incorporating data even is so strange to even the, you know, even to the mainstream houses and doing a lot of the things that we do. So, you know, and I feel like that, um, is part of the problem. And, you know, and it's still, you know, the industry still works on a three-year schedule and, you know, things are still very, <laughs> uh, you know, to anybody in tech, it's, it's impossible to conceive of, you know? So I, I've, I've had two really successful book launches. I hit the New York mm-hmm. Times uh, with, with my first big book. Uh, my first book, though, with the one that had five years of research, in it and and just two years to write and and just so important it was a tiny advance i, I published it through wiley they they sold it uh, the division in the middle of the launch launched it six weeks ahead of time and it only sold like five thousand copies mm-hmm. and I'm like this book actually will prevent asperger's and kids like, like I, I wrote it for that reason even though right. that's not the marketing and it, it just it almost broke my heart i'm like how is this possible like how broken is it so then just like like you you sit down and you're like, okay, like I'm going to do this right. And you know, the next time uh, it's it sold hundreds of thousands of copies okay. for mm-hmm. the Bulletproof Diet, which sure. is, but it, like you said, when you dig into the industry, you're like that is the most bizarre way of structuring it. Yeah. And and it turns out it, it's the same. If you want to go to radio from podcasting, like, okay, Bulletproof Radio, like 30 million downloads. Like it, it's a, it, it's a, it's amazing, mm-hmm. but you, you want to put that on national radio. Like I've tried twice and both times it just like does weird stuff. And, and you look at TV and movies and almost every industry, it, it's done the way it was a hundred years ago. And, and to yeah. someone uh, like you, who's been a successful entrepreneur, who's navigated an old industry, uh, how do you deal with just like, like the, the sense of sheer stupidity that you, you must see like all around you? <laughs> yeah. And that, I mean, I thank you for using those words so I do not have to, <laughs> but that is on, that is for me the hardest thing every week, every day. You know, is just calling any anybody we have to partner with and seeing how antiquated their systems are and how it's not that they're uncooperative in changing those systems. It's just that it's such a slow process to do that 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 creates more stress in my life because I simply cannot resolve their inadequate systems. You know, and and so and and that is actually the biggest problem in my life right now is how much anxiety it produces to, because you know, and and this is sort of the myth right now is that people believe that you know like self publishing will undermine all this stuff and that digital products are what people actually want, but but none of those things are true. You know, the industry works very much the way that it always has, and sales are you know twenty fifteen was a record sales year for books. You know, and it, and it. But at the same time, it's we're still using these systems. You know, they they still sell to wholesalers nine months before publication. You know, they'll still sell. You know, the uh, you know uh, especially holiday things even further out. You know, and that that part of it is it's because the people that you know control these aspects of the industry 
I see no reason to change because they, what they're doing is still working, even at the increased volume of new books coming out every day, you know? And I guess that's the difference is that even, you know, 5,000 books is a paltry sum, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, it's like painful to you as an author that put years of work into that, but that is nearly double the industry average, <laughs> you know, right? I mean, that's insane. Like that, that it hurts to think of like, oh, great. Well, after all that, that's a flop. But in fact, that is a success according to the industry, you know, and, and the really the problem is that there just simply are too many books being sold in every day. Yeah. And, and some of the books, I, some of them are not worthy. Like, like there's right. a lot of recycled content. I, in fact, mm-hmm. I, I see my content recycled sometimes. You're like, really? <laughs> yep. There, there's yeah. the guide to hacking your sleep. <laughs> right. Like, I, I wonder where you got the collagen and honey stuff because I know where that came from. <laughs> and right. it, it's, uh, it, it's frustrating too because the signal to noise ratio is going down in, in publishing, right? Mm hmm. Mm hmm. As, as someone who runs a successful publishing company and has this data mindset that, that just comes from you neurologically, what, what, what should people do? Like if, if you're listening to this show, there's probably <laughs> a quarter million people are going to listen to this interview and they, are, they can buy books, they cannot buy books. How do you know when you're getting <laughs> like real content versus like, okay, someone's selling another book that they threw together? Yeah, and I feel like You know, for me, I really, really push this idea of the, like, this is the best case we've ever heard for the need for a consumer to have good analytical skills. Oh, there you go. Because because they need to be able to, like, and and this is, and I, and, you know, admittedly, I see this, these skills developed much better in Canadian consumers and in British consumers for whatever reason, you know. In in Canada, it's because they're sorry. I, I don't know why else, but. But they but living they, here, I can say that <laughs> they know how to look at a book and figure out if it's for them yeah. and it, w- what it offers them. You know, what are the benefits of the book? And, you know, if it's a subject they're interested in and familiar with, they know what is original research and what is, you know, what is not. And I feel like that is really what the American consumer needs to perfect is because. And but the difference, of course, is that in the U.S., most people are buying books as a gift for a relative or someone they care about or things like that. So they don't use those same analytical skills. This is probably a really good time to to just mention. If you're listening to this, it, it it's definitely it, within the next thirty days. Uh, there's a statistical likelihood that someone you know is going to have a birthday or that there's some holiday. And I, I can absolutely, without a doubt, recommend that it's a really good idea to buy a, a copy of Joe's book and, <laughs> and give it to someone. Right, the, the you you want to hold up a copy of it real quick? <laughs> the statistical likelihood is high that it will benefit someone in your life. There you go. It's called and, Good Trouble. <laughs> and so, yeah, it is a... Wait, we got to get both cameras here. So, and it, you know, and this is... Um, I feel like on one hand it is, you know, it's for people that have an interest in entrepreneurism as well as people that, you know, are themselves or someone they care about, you know, dealing with Asperger's or what is likely some related syndrome. So so for that, for that person in your life who is a little odd and you've often <laughs> said is probably on the spectrum, they actually probably are somewhere even if it is in Asperger's. The, the number of people who just have brains that work a little differently. We, we, we call them uh, engineers. Uh, for, <laughs> <laughs> uh, in fact, one of my favorite Dilberts ever is uh, some little cartoon strip. In fact, it might have even been animated. And you know, the, the mother takes her, her son in uh, to the, like the, the young Dilbert into the doctor. And the doctor says, well, we'd, we'd, we'd like to do a scan, but the brain scan's broken. And of course, the little kid takes apart the machine and fixes it right there. And he goes, oh, it's worse than we thought. I'm, I'm sorry, ma'am, your, your son is an, an engineer. And uh, so th- this is running rampant. And so the, the person around you who probably doesn't have that level of self-awareness, I actually liked this book uh, uh, for that reason, just because it, it's actually got a good mix of business stuff. Uh, but it's also got a good mix of like what's going on in in your head that's different. So it's actually a useful gift. And since today that's what we do in the U.S. anyway. And while you're at it, if you <laughs> if you just double down, you stack it up with a bulletproof diet, then it's going to be like upgrading someone's life like you've never seen. So there we go. We did our our good author plugs for the day, right? 
Yeah, <laughs> yeah, I know, right? <laughs> and, and, and you know, and that's uh, I think that's the thing too is that you get especially for older people, you know, um, anybody that came of age after ninety two, they're not gonna have been properly diagnosed. And then you get a little bit like, it's like a pudding mix, you know, Mm -hmm. where like symptoms start to disappear. And then what really, really struck me as odd was that that makes it harder for the professionals to diagnose, you know, people that probably have Asperger's. And it would get to the point where they would say, you know, where I've met so many people that are like, well, I've been told that it's 99% likely, but nobody wants to actually confirm my diagnosis, (laughs) you know? I had a really interesting experience. I, I was working at a startup uh, that ended up having a very successful exit, and I was going to Wharton Business School in the executive program. So, like, super intense. It's the same number of hours as a full time MBA program while you're working full time. So, it, it's like burning the candle at both ends. And I, I was like having test performance issues. Like, I, I would get 100% on the first question, 70 on the second question. And then I would have no mental activity on the third question. I would get like zero points. I'm like, but wow. I, I studied this. And it was a, a, it was a curve. You could plot it on every test. I'm like, I don't know what's going on here. So I, of course, like brain scans and all, all sorts of stuff. And I wanted to try modafinil. Uh, this is way back in the day. Mm-hmm. So I, I went and I did a, a, a SPECT scan uh, where they inject radioactive dye to look at metabolic activity in the brain, see which parts of the brain are taking up glucose. And... It was pretty shocking because the the psychiatrist I was seeing clearly thought I was hitting him up for Adderall. Like lots of students mm-hmm. do that, right? When he got the brain scan results back, this is a direct quote. I'll never forget it because I was kind of stunned. He, he goes, he goes, he goes. Inside your brain is total chaos. I have no idea how you're standing here in front of me now. You have the best camouflage of anyone I've ever met. <laughs> so. He had identified me as being completely neurotypical because I yeah. learned how to play the game in like Silicon Valley, which is a good place to learn how to play the game. Like, like, like sure. you're, you're playing at a high level. Uh, and it was with intent that I learned how to do all this stuff. Uh, um, but the fact that inside my brain there was no metabolic activity in parts of the brain where really there should have been some was, uh, was a clue. And, and I did manage to turn those parts of the brain back on eventually. But that, your story reminded me of that when, with what you were just saying there because... Um, that there is that that sort of a, a thing that that you learn to do. You know, you're you're almost forty years old. And you're like you're running a successful company. You actually do know how to do what you're doing, but it's different inside your head. So, like, what happens to you when you walk into a party or a meeting? Like, like what happens inside your head? Um, I am immediately overwhelmed, and I have to really mitigate. I mean, and that's like any time there's more than six people in the room. I'll need to plot where my chair is, where I feel comfortable, and I have to sort of carve that space out for myself and build an environment that I can manage in my head, you yeah. know? Now, you just said that. You run a successful company, and you do those things, right? Like, that that's the thing. Someone who doesn't have that, just walk into a room, like, whatever, mm-hmm. like, like, they don't do that, and they might run a successful company, they might not, but, but the fact of the matter is that absolutely happens. Yeah. Uh, and for me, I used to do that. Sure. And now what I do, though, is, is I, I learned, I actually process auditory signals and uh, visual signals at a level up from the brainstem compared to most people. Mm-hmm. Um, some, someone or another hypothesized probably that it's a congenital thing. But I went through and I retrained my ears to better discriminate auditory sounds. But if there was, let's say, if this was a noisy bar, for me to hear what you were saying, I have to really focus. It takes energy, like glucose or ketones in my brain to hear your voice. Whereas for someone who's wired normally, they, they will actually effortlessly pick a voice out in a, in a noisy room. Sure. And like, okay, that's a very common ADD, Asperger's sort of thing. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to choose the quietest table at a restaurant and I'm going to sit down, and because I know that my visual processing is, it takes more work. My brain sees light differently than the average brain. Of course, one in two people do this. Helen Erland's work has been fantastic for people with Asperger's, autism, and ADD. Um, I'll also choose the table that doesn't have like a spotlight shining into my eyes because I'm going to get tired and cranky sure. if I'm sitting there in a noisy environment with two different loud, drunk people on either side of me with a spotlight in my eyes. I'm just yeah. not going to have resilience as long as I normally would. Okay. I learned all this stuff, but no one tells you that. Right, and, it, right. and if you're not neurologically normal, or you just have some weaknesses and some strengths that are different than the average, and you go to an environment that starts taxing you, 
You're like, I don't know why I'm tired. I don't know why I don't want to be there, but I just don't want to go back. And then you feel like you're antisocial. Does any of that sound familiar to you? Do you, oh, yeah, do you yeah, look yeah. at those angles too? I mean, I, I've, you know, I cut out alcohol completely years ago. <laughs> I cut out sugar completely years ago because they were just grinding me down yeah. so bad. And so, you know, it's, I don't go to a bar, you know, like there would be nothing for me there, you know, yep. but I do still end up, you know, I mean, and a lot of time it's industry events or e- even conferences or expos are so incredibly crowded and difficult, you know, and I, I have a service dog. It's like hard to walk as it is. It's hard to like make sure. Oh, she's you have not. a service dog. Okay, cool. Is, is yeah. that, I noticed the dog sitting on your lap. Is that your service dog? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Oh, cool. Uh, what kind of dog is he? Uh, she's a rat terrier. She, a rat terrier, cool. Mm-hmm. I, uh, I've always had dogs, uh, at least most of the time, and uh, my last dachshund uh, before this one was part rat terrier. Uh-huh, uh-huh. Uh, it was, it was a, definitely kind of a cool little breed. Sure. And, and so it's like, with all of that, it's the, you know, I don't think anyone would ever notice that mm-hmm. I am overwhelmed or, you know, dealing with things that they aren't having to deal with. And I think for me, a lot of it, I just made, I created systems where it becomes manageable, where it's not yeah. overwhelming, even when I'm having to deal with things that other people don't have to deal with, you know? And so similarly, like what it sounds like for you, you know, I just found a way to make that seem not weird and, you know, maybe not even noticeable. I, I found that if I, I just, I turn up my mitochondrial function uh, and I've done all the the rewiring of stress responses. I actually not stressed it. Like it's not as comfortable as it could be, but but the the level of stress I would have felt just overwhelmed. It, it's pretty much gone. Like I I might get tired eventually because like well, it's you know I'm getting a headache because these lights are just like you know fluorescent lights in the corner of my vision. They they just are uncomfortable. Kind of like mm-hmm. having a stone in your shoe for for someone who doesn't like stones in their shoes. Right. But yeah. it, it just is what it is versus like that that feeling I used to get, which was like intense discomfort, kind of like I'm going to die, like I need to get out of here kind of stuff. Mm-hmm. I hacked that to the point that I'm, I'm actually really comfortable in an environment with lots of people. It, it doesn't bother me either way. But mm-hmm. if I have to hear in detail what the person's saying to me and everyone around me is talking, there is a time limit that I haven't learned how to transcend, but it's pretty long compared to what it used to be. Like it's hours and hours, and then it's like, okay, I'm spent. Whereas I think maybe some people aren't quite as spent as I would be, but like I can live with that. Right, and I think for a lot of people, you know, I think even uh, neurotypical people would probably have, you know, they have some discomfort, but I don't. I think the difference is they wouldn't have to develop or hone an awareness like you or I would to realizing what's going on with them or how they're responding to it. What, one of the gifts that, that my nervous system has given me is that I realize there are some things in the environment that make me stronger and some things that make me weaker. Mm-hmm. And when I put in the trouble of making a system and identifying those things and then reading the papers, reading the research, you realize, wow, <laughs> there's a lot going on here. And then you take that to someone who either is neurotypical or believes they're neurotypical. I, I'm, I don't really believe in the term neurotypical. <laughs> mm-hmm. like, like it's always, you're deviating in some ways on some things from the average uh, that almost everyone can have like at least 20% better performance by messing with their environment until it's tuned for their biology. Sure. And, and maybe for you or me, it's 40% better performance. Yeah. And, Right, yeah. but it, it's it, there's always meat on that bone if you pursue that avenue, and just having a, a greater effect for you and me means that we're more likely to notice it. And the things that are reducing your stress for a substantial percentage of the population, it's going to help them too. And this visual thing we talked about, uh, Erlen syndrome, forty eight percent of people uh, will test positive, so they're they're stressing their brains more than they need to when they're trying to read or when they're paying attention, and the people who benefit the most from just from figuring this out are autistic people, Asperger's people, ADD people, dyslexic people, all, all those things. Like like they get the most, but you can take someone someone else, and if they're one of the one and two, they're like, oh my god, things are so much better. You take someone sitting next to them, and they're like, no effect, completely invisible to them. Right? Mm-hmm. But then you switch over to some other modality, and then you know the person with the colored overlays on what they're reading. The other thing didn't affect them. So having a list of things that make people generally strong or weak and then just systematically testing them transforms everyone I've ever met. Like there's always something like, oh, that got better. 
except the one in a hundred person who's like probably like half Viking and they're like, I don't know, like I, I rub mercury from a broken thermometer on my skin. Uh, you know, I, I drink, you know, 14 six packs a day and I only eat pizza and I ride a century every day on my bike and like I kick ass and like, <laughs> I don't know what to do, but like I like your jeans. Right. Um, it, right. There just aren't very many of those left anymore. Yeah, I, I, I do feel like that kind of body goes away. You know, you just, now it's, I, I mean, maybe, I, I feel like it's probably because I live in Portland, so to some degree, you know, people are either, like, hyper aware of anything they're insensitive to, or oh, yeah. they just feel left out of that, so they want to be, have a list of things that they can't be around, you know, but it does seem like the person that, you know, the, like, Keith Richards... Uh, of the world are uh, fleeting, you know. <laughs> that, that is that is very true, and, and Portland is a good area for that. I a lot of the bulletproof teams up in Portland. Uh, we we roast our coffee up there, and it's uh, it, it's a good city. I, I definitely like that. Mm-hmm. Now, I want to talk some more about uh, other other kind of hacks you have because you get more of that uh, social anxiety. That than average, uh, and Aspergers can just bring on meltdowns. You're like, like this is too much stress. You mentioned you have a service dog. Do you have like a daily stress management ritual or practice or something? Um, so <laughs> I have probably the silliest one <laughs> you'll ever hear, but it, it provides me great endless entertainment. And I feel like this is the continuity of my teenage self with my nearly forty year old <laughs> self. And so. And, and, and my reporterly skills as well. So when someone behaves inappropriately, you know, people constantly are, you know, and so I'm aware of it. And rather than getting upset about it, I will compose a tweet that is just describing in a completely denotative way what happened. And to most people, they can see the humor, you know, however dry in this you know, transmission, this communication. And I feel like it's fascinating because to a needy person, they see that as like, I'm asking for sympathy, which I'm not, you know, I'm, <laughs> I'm saying this is hilarious, you know, and I, and some people that I know, they feel like I have more inappropriate things happen to me or happen around me than most. But You know, and it's also a way for me to practice my skills of observation and understanding this stuff. But it it really does reduce my stress load to sort of get it out of my system. And it makes me not have to process it anymore for whatever reason. So so offloading is a big strategy for you, like just get it out. Mm -hmm. And I feel like, and then I have this beautiful record of these are all the, you know, the cataloging of inappropriate and hilarious things that have happened in my presence you know, because it's just so daily, you know. Do, at this point in your life, do, do you feel comfortable in your own skin? Yeah. yeah. Um, did you I always? Do. When, when you were young, did you? Oh, no, not at all. Not at all. I mean, Neither. I would be, I would have very awkward posture. I would have, you know, I, w- I would get migraines. Um, oh, yeah. And they, they would tell me that the problem was just like literally like how tense my muscles would get. You know, because I was so anxiety ridden constantly. Whereas now, you know, we have younger staff uh, and they are often, you know, they're, they've known other people with Asperger's. They've known people that had uh, maybe a lower level of expectation than I do. Um, And so they really will have a hard time seeing it in me because it doesn't mesh with their understanding of what Asperger's looks like, you know. And so I feel like that's really the transformation is that, like, I can pass, you know, and I can, you know, and maybe not to everybody. And obviously things still happen and I create faux pas and that, but not, you know, it's maybe one percent of what it once was, you know. And now I at least know how to, like, acknowledge and apologize and you know realize <laughs> what has gone on rather than, like, explaining how what I did was well intended or you know in their benefit or whatever yeah uh, that that whole y- you're you're wrong uh, sort of explanation doesn't normally <laughs> work for me either <laughs> doesn't help no i mean because and that's the thing that's really hard for me to understand is that like intentions don't really matter yep. you know it's people are very you know and so i guess the thing 
and maybe it's the awkwardness of it all, but like, I feel like my biohack, you know, is that I, you know, and I, I don't know if you saw, um, so there's been a, a lot of things, you know, like my greatest likelihood of death is suicide, you know, just statistically probability, you know, because of Asperger's, because of, you know, all of my background factors. But I learned, um, if you saw the New York Times piece uh, yesterday, there was a really fascinating thing about how the uh, even college enrollment levels of men in the U.S. are way down. Uh, they dropped nine percent in over the last twenty years. Yeah, and and a lot, and it's really it comes down to the fact of they do not know how to offload and talk about their feelings, and they cannot do it with their friends because there isn't you know the the social mores are, don't exist for that. So I really feel like my biohack is men talking about their feelings. And that, for me, has been the thing that's totally made me comfortable in my skin. And while it does certainly, like, take people by surprise <laughs> plenty frequently, like, I feel like that's really, I think, the next level for a lot of people. When I was uh, when I was a kid, and this may be a generational thing, but you're about the same generation, I, I used to feel like, like if, if you really had many feelings, uh, you were pretty much weak. Like, I, I used to actively dislike feelings. Mm-hmm. And I, that might be partly just the Asperger ADD kind of mindset. Um, because, like, you know, why, why would you bother with that? They, they don't make any sense. Mm-hmm. Uh, and what I ended up uh, unpacking in, in therapeutic kind of sessions uh, was that I actually didn't have labels for any of the things. But, like, like just about every feeling has a physical sensation yeah. correlation. No one taught me that. And maybe some people just know that. But I, I think most kids learn that. Uh, like when they're little, you know, their mom says, well, you're feeling X. And they're like, oh, you know, that weird feeling it is that. I didn't have any of that wiring. So mm-hmm. it took like these, these two days of, of like feeling extremely uncomfortable uh, in, uh, in like a group environment working in, in like a group therapy thing. And finally, the, the woman who was working with me, she's like, well, you must be feeling something. I'm like, yeah, I'm pretty pissed off right now. You know, like, like justifiably <laughs> right. so. Like, I'm like, you know, right. she's like, no, there's other feelings in there. I'm like, no. And she finally said, "Okay, I'm gonna look at uh, like, like, is there a feeling like you know, in in your in anywhere in your body?" And I'm like, "Yeah, my my stomach feels weird." And she goes, "Great, that feeling that's called fear." And I'm like, <laughs> "I'm like, are you kidding me? Really?" And she goes, "No, seriously, like that, that, like all those things that are happening right now, like that's the name for that." And I'm like, "That is the most profound thing I've ever heard of." Because then I said, "Why would it be fear? That doesn't make any sense. Like, there's nothing to be afraid of here." And right. and then came the real bomb for me, which was, of course it doesn't make any sense. It's a feeling. Feelings don't have to make sense. And I was like, holy crap! Like no one ever taught me that either. And that for me was one of the things that let me. All right, like I'm gonna make a map. And now I actually have pretty good emotional awareness of like like my state. And I'm maybe like you. I'm I'm pretty fearless about talking about it. But when I could identify it, I could then manage it and actually like learn to turn on happiness and you know turn on. Uh, empathy and and heart openness and all those sorts of things that to me were states I didn't know how to identify. Mm-hmm. Yeah, do you, and I'm sorry, do you feel ahead. like you've gotten somewhere in, in that direction? Do you think that's possible for people with Aspergers? Yeah, yeah. I've, I mean, of course. I mean, of course I do. But I'm I'm granted aiming higher than your average. You know, of course. And so, um, 15 years ago, I remember. Um, I can't remember. Yeah, it was my when I was getting divorced. It was the counselor was like how are you feeling right now? And everything I said was my thoughts. <laughs> exactly. Because I was not aware that there was anything but my thoughts. And yeah. so I was like, this is what I think about that. This is what I think about that. And then she pushed and pushed and pushed until it became clear that I had no idea that feelings existed. Yes. Or were a thing or that there was anything to be aware of in the first place. And then, you know, like 15 years later, um, I, I was in Washington, D.C. a month ago um, I was at the National Bike Summit, which is like a you know national conference for people that are advocates. And I had a moment where, you know, two men came up to the table and I was talking to them and, you know, and I, I basically, you know, I heard them expressing things about their lives, but in very guarded ways. And I, and I sort of, I gave a little bit of myself. I told a little story. I talked about my feelings 
And within a minute, both of them were talking about their feelings. And it was very apparent that neither of them had ever done that to each other before. They were friends. And, you know, 15 minutes later, they, like, wrapped it up. And they have this grand plan, you know, to how they're going to resolve what's going on in their lives. And the two women in earshot were like, how did you do that? I've never seen that happen in the world. <laughs> like men talking to other men about their feelings, let alone in the presence of a woman. Like it just does not happen. And, and it was, I, admittedly, I didn't even think of it in advance. I, I, you know, I did what seemed natural, like what it seemed like that they wanted from the conversation and what they, you know, the ways that they were engaging with me. And so again, I, you know, it was like once more I was using data to draw out what I thought would be an appropriate response, and and and, and you know, and I think it was. But it's you know, it's funny that even then, like that's the degree that you know I can take it. You know, that's cool. So so that that ought to offer hope for for parents of very young Aspies who might hear this and go, oh, there's no hope for my kid. You know, little little Johnny will never have a date. It's like, no, chill. Johnny will have a date. Uh, she might be odd too, but that's why engineers reproduce. Yeah. And uh, if you say, say for someone listening who is uh, has knows they have ADD or Aspergers or something like that on, on the spectrum, if they want to start a business, what advice would you have for them right now? You know, I would say. Everybody will tell you, and you know, and everything I ever heard was it's not going to work. You know, it's really difficult. It's really competitive. I would say, you know, I follow the the Paul Hawken advice of your, um, where he says, do the thing exactly how you feel it, in your own way, the way that you believe is right, because nobody could ever mimic that, and it will be nothing but uniquely your own. You know, obviously, I'm paraphrasing here. Mm-hmm. I haven't read the book in twenty something years, but the <laughs> you know the 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 concept is that you know people really try to take an existing idea and twist it a little bit, or to like do something that they think is of good sound business mind. But I don't think that's very good advice. I think you really need to do the thing that is personal for you and that you have some kind of entrenchment in. Because I think that'll come across as more authentic to the community of people that the products serve. And I think it'll become, you know, and this is the other thing that people come up constantly that they're afraid that someone will steal their ideas or whatever. But I just, you know, it's impossible when it's that way. If it's, Mm -hmm. if you're really, you know, you're communicating genuinely of yourself, that it's, nobody could ever take that and do it as well as you do. Yeah. You know? I, I hear you. That that's really cool. I I wish that I had a known that I had any of this stuff going on when I was younger and, and starting companies, and uh, so that I had that kind of advice when I was younger. I think now one of the advantages uh, of, of being young and wanting to start a company is that uh, guys like you and me put in sick amounts of infrastructure. Like I, I helped to build the cloud and, and the internet as we know it today. Uh, a lot of my time in Silicon Valley was working on projects like that. And it, it's shockingly easy to, to do things. And you also have a much better chance of having self-awareness and having someone point out, uh, your nervous system is different than normal. Your two standard deviations off. Here's the direction you're off and here's the compensating strategies. Like it's much easier to find that knowledge and, and to just recognize everyone is off on some some of the thousands of ways you can be off. And it's not that being on or off is a good or a bad thing. It's just we're all different that way. But now that you can identify the norm and you can say, here's how I can uh, I, I can at least approach the norm when I want to and still live where I am, that, that's a pretty elegant way to live, I think, no matter how your nervous system works. Mm-hmm. And you know, I think a lot of people, they try to think that they'll live on a desert island and not have to engage with you know people that I would call neurotypical and, you know, but I think that's just not possible. It's like you have to, you know, not have to, but I think it, that's the source of unhappiness for yeah. people, you know, who are on the spectrum is that it's so isolating to begin with that you really need to have social contact with all kinds of people, you know? It, it, even if you feel like you don't like it, there's still great value in it and you need to overcome the anxiety there. Mm-hmm. Well, well, we're running up on the end of the show and I, I do want to know if someone came to you tomorrow and said, uh, look, I want to perform better at everything I do in life. Uh, what are the three most important things, three most important pieces of advice you have for me? What would you offer? Whether they're Asperger's or not, you don't really know, just the mm-hmm. average person walking off the street. Right. I would say 
that number one is like have a bike commute to work. You know, I feel like and and which is also means live in a city and work manageably nearby. You know, I feel like that solves so many problems, you know, and it, it, like from, you know, correlation of divorce rates to car commutes to, you know, like just basic level of 15 minutes of exercise and all that, you know, and I think people see that as unreasonable or or, you know, not for them or kind of causing other problems, but it's totally not. You can do it. Cool. And then I would say finding what you need as far as personal time away from other people or away from work or away, you know. <laughs> Alone time, right? <laughs> figuring out an ideal amount of that every day, whether that's like with your spouse or with your dog or with your kids or whatever, or by yourself and making that non-negotiable, you know, do your thing. And then I would say like figure out what your, you know, figure out what work makes you genuinely happy because I feel like that's the thing that, you know, you can never replace and it'll, and that's the thing that, you know, I think causes the most deep seated problems that there's really no way out of. If, if your work is making you miserable versus where, if your work is fulfilling, you know, it's just not, uh, it's, it's just not even, you know, it makes money insignificant, I think. Wonderful advice. Uh, thanks. Mm -hmm. uh, you've been listening to Joe Beal, author of Good Trouble, Building a Successful Life in Business with Asperger's, in case you tuned in halfway through the show, holding <laughs> up the book there. It's a, it's a worthwhile read for everyone, whether or not you uh, have Asperger's. Uh, it, it'll open, open your eyes to what uh, probably if you sit down at, at a table with three or four other people, one of the people at the table has a lot of the characteristics in that book. Mm -hmm. uh, and it, uh, it it's useful whether you're that person or the person sitting next to that person. Uh, Joe, uh, any uh, any URLs, any other places people should go to check out your book, check out Microcosm Publishing or any of the other things you're working on? Sure. Uh, microcosmpublishing.com is the, the spot uh, generally. Um, and we have, um, I also am involved in a, a social justice video project called the uh, Groundswell, which you can see at p.org, p-d-o-t.org. Beautiful. Thank you so much for being on Bulletproof Radio. Mm -hmm. It was a, a fun interview, and uh, keep on giving back. Mm -hmm. Take care. Thanks so much. If you like today's episode, you know what to do. Pick up a copy of Good Trouble, Building a Successful Life in Business with Asperger's, because when you read good stuff from good people, good stuff happens. And while you're reading, you're going to need to fuel your brain. And, well... I got to show you this because it's the coolest thing I've ever seen. Okay, maybe not. It's <laughs> Instamix. This just came out. Uh, we've been working on this for three years, and this has wow. grass-fed butter and brain octane oil in a single-serving, fully portable packet. Wow. So you can just brew your Bulletproof coffee beans in your hotel room, which is trivially easy. You add this to your Bulletproof travel mug, shake it up, and you're good to go. You've got your Bulletproof coffee for the morning, you feel amazing, and you can do this over and over and over. I'm super stoked. Bulletproof Instamix. You can find it on the website, and you can even subscribe, so it just arrives every month. And if you want to buy lots of it for your office building, we can hook you up with that. <laughs> Instamix, it rocks. And so did today's show. If you like the show, seriously, the best way to say thanks, aside from trying Instamix, is head on over and read uh, read Joe's book. It's, uh, uh, it's a good book. And having the ability to, uh, to interview guys like this, uh, for me, is part of what we just talked about, part of this, uh, this like, social time with intelligent people. It, it, I find it really fulfilling to be able to do the show. I started the show, and I still do the show. Uh, two episodes a week is actually a really intense schedule with all the preparation work and, and all. Uh, and I do the show because uh, it... It, it, these are conversations that I would have even if no one was listening. And it, it's a chance to just learn from people. So I'm like, I can't believe other people want to like sit in over my shoulder on these conversations. But that's why I do it. That's why I love doing it because it gives back to you. It also gives back to me. And uh, when you take your time to learn more from people on the show, I, I believe it's going to help you. With 30 million downloads and counting on the show, that's the equivalent of 65 human lifetimes if I did my math right. And if you think about that, I've either killed 65 people if I basically had a whole bunch of dick jokes, or I may have 
um, I may have helped 65 entire human lifetimes. I actually feel a sense of responsibility for that. So I won't waste your time on the show and I won't bring you people who I haven't vetted as knowing how to share something of value and having some value to share. So thank you for listening and thank you for coming back and thank you for subscribing on iTunes and just thanks for your last hour of time. Uh, I hope it was worth it for you. It was for me. (laughs) Bye. Mm. Cool. Wow. Did you know that Bulletproof is on Instagram? You can find us at Bulletproof Coffee or my personal feed is dave.asprey. Hope to see you there.